Hello everyone and welcome to one more tutorial. This is João and today we're going to discuss a molecular and cellular biology technique called restriction mapping. And I have a formal definition of what this means, but I'm going to try to simplify it. But basically restriction mapping is when you try to create a genetic map based on the location of cleavage sites, very important, of several restriction endonucleases on a DNA molecule. So I'm going to try to break it down and simplify it for you, but you're very welcome to use this definition in a formal occasion, say an oral exam or even a written one. Now, what you need to know is that restriction, first a definition of, or have a brief look of what restriction endonucleases are capable of doing. And these enzymes, their enzymes, are able to cleave DNA. They are able to break a DNA molecule into pieces. And I'm going to draw here a DNA molecule for you. And bear in mind that I'm not a good artist, but I'm going to try to draw one for you right here. This is my DNA molecule. And these enzymes recognize palindromic sequences. Don't know if you heard what a palindrome is, or palindrome sequences. Basically, a sequence of numbers or letters that can be read both forward or the same way forward and backward. But on DNA what this means is that say if you have a sequence that reads G A A T T C in this direction when you look at the complementary sequence you will also read G A A T T C so it's read the same way on both or opposite ways. And this is a specific sequence for a restriction endonuclease, very popular one, called ECOR1. But I just wanted to give you an idea that these restriction endonucleases are able to find these palindromic sequences in a DNA molecule. They recognize them and then cleave the molecule so they cleave out a sequence of DNA once they recognize those palindromic sequences so in genetic mapping or restriction mapping what we're going to do using these enzymes is then use different types of restriction endonucleases where they're going to re recognize different palindromic sequences and then cut or cleave out different sequences of this DNA molecule that we have here. Once that is done, you can then build a map. And you can do so running a gel electrophoresis where you're going to be able to separate these I'm going to use the proper colors so you're going to be able to separate these two sequences based on their sizes so this is restriction mapping in a very small nutshell now what I want to say as well a point that I have here is that restriction endonucleases are identified in bacteria. And why? Because bacteria are very s smart organisms. What they do, and again I'm going to try to draw a beautiful bacterium here. Say this is a bacterium, the cell with its DNA molecule dispersed in the cytoplasm and then you will have several restriction endonucleases hanging around the cytoplasm and this is a way that bacteria found to say when a virus for example tries to invade a cell and inject its viral DNA so this is viral DNA what 
or through evolution, these smart organisms created these restriction endonucleases. Well, they did not create it, but through evolution, these restriction endonucleases ended up here. And what they do is they're able then to recognize palindromic sequences on the viral DNA and then just cleave it or break it. That way, it won't be able to use this bacterium as a host cell. Very smart thing to do. Now, one thing, one small point that I would like to make here before we go into more detail on restriction mapping is that this is a technique that is used uh, when you want to study virus or um, when you want to study viral DNA, for example. Very useful technique because you can create a specific map of viral DNA and identify a specific type of virus, for example. And also you can study bacteria or study bacterial DNA. When you want to study larger genomes, for example, plant genomes or even human genomes, it's very hard to use this technique because you're going to have, since we have a huge or a great genome, it's hard to use different types of restriction endonucleases and break it down and then create a map. It usually, if we did that, then it would be it wouldn't be as clear as we have here. You probably have a smear rather than separated sequences because our genome or the human genome is very large. So this technique, this restriction mapping is used for or mainly for these two types of um, DNAs. So on the previous slide, I gave you uh, the definition and a brief description of what restriction mapping is. But now I have, I would like to give you a practical example of this technique. And what I have here is a very complex, what it looks like a very complex drawing uh, with lots of rectangles, but I'm going to try to break it down for you uh, and make it a little bit easier. And the first two rectangles that we have here, as you probably guessed, these, this is representing a DNA molecule. And a DNA molecule that belongs to a specific class of viruses, this is what we're going to look at, called bacteriophages. And bacteriophages are viruses that love to use bacteria as their host cell, so they can make more or multiply and make more viruses. So in this specific case though we're going to look at lambda phages and lambda phages are viruses that like to infect or to use E. coli as their host cells. And remember from the previous slide I gave you a story of why E, uh, why bacteria use restriction endonucleases so they can protect themselves from foreign DNA and E. coli is no different and it has a restriction endonuclease called ECOR1. Now ECOR1 we're going to use here in this practical example is going to meet with the DNA from the lambda phage and it's going to find specific palindromic sequences and then, of course, cleave this DNA molecule and, of course, create these sequences or these fragments out of this DNA molecule, this initial DNA molecule. And it's important to say that, or talk about sizes, so the size, the original size of this DNA molecule is about 48.5 kilo bases. And one kilo base, if you remember well, equals to a thousand base pairs. It's a unit that is quite used when you talk to, 
when you talk about uh, the size of DNA molecules, kilobase. Now, the first fragment that is created by the cleavage of this molecule, this DNA molecule, by equal R1 is about 21.2 kilobases. There is another one here that is 4.9 kilobases, 5.6 kilobases, another one with 7.5 kilobases, one that is seven or 5.7 kilobases, and the smallest one is about 3.6 kilobases. So this enzyme is able to find seven, this seven or one, two, three, four, five, um, so five cleavage sites, and then create one, two, three, four, five, six different fragments. And what you will do now is you're going to use a technique that we're not going to go into too much detail, but it's called gel electrophoresis to create this restriction map. And what's going to happen then you will have, let's say, a solution containing all these fragments and you're going to inject it into a gel and a gel electrophoresis is basically a gel that is made out of either agarose or sometimes polyacrylamide and what happens here is that this gel is under a buffer or in buffer conditions and then it's you have a electrode running or electric current so you're going to have a negative electrode and a positive electrode. And then what's going to happen is when you start running the current, these little segments, they're all together here initially, or let me use a different color that is more appropriate for what I have next. So they're all collected here. These six fragments are all here. And what's going to happen is going, they're going to travel or migrate through this gel. So there is going to be migration to be formal of DNA. So these fragments are going to travel from the negative electrode to the positive one. And why does that happen? Because if you look at a DNA molecule, the backbone is negative because of the phosphate groups. So let's say that these fragments are negatively charged and for that reason when you create a current they're going to migrate towards the positive, towards the positive side. Now with magic, I can show you here that this is what you would get. So you will get six bends and each bend will represent these fragments here. So the largest, the largest one, you see it here. And as you see, these bends are separated in gel electrophoresis. Sorry, I misspelled gel electrophoresis. Uh, so these bends are, or these fragments are separated here according to size. So there is separation according to size. And the largest molecules, or the largest fragment right here, is going to travel slower than the smallest one. So the smallest one you're going to find ahead of the game, right here. So this is the smallest fragment and then you have the other fragments following. So you have the 7.5 here, which is the second largest, and the second slowest one to travel, let's say. And then you're going to have the 5.7 kilobases, 5.6 kilobases, and this one here is 4.9 kilobases. 
So this smallest one is a head because it's able to travel faster and the largest one stays behind because it travels slower. And this, my friends, is how you create a map. This is the map right here. Because now you look and see the different bends in different positions and you can say and identify this map belonging to the lambda phage. So this is, in a nutshell, what restriction mapping is. We created a map using gel electrophoresis and restriction endonucleases to identify a specific type of virus. And you can do with other smaller or with other small um, genomes, say bacteria, but not in uh, cells, genomes, or human genomes because they're larger and this would probably be more complicated to do.